Today, you know, we're standing at the end of our series, and what do we know? We know that we've learned about every piece of armor that Apostle Paul talks about in Scripture. We can see that, that we, we, we know what to put into place. We're hearing about all the different pieces, and now, hopefully, I hope that if you've been following along with us, you understand what God has given you and how to use it in the battle that you face spiritually in your life. But it's important to know that Paul doesn't stop at verse 17. You know, he lists all the armor, but he doesn't stop there. He says, put this in place, take this in place. But then he doesn't stop. But what does he say? And pray. See, see, Paul, after talking about and ending his scripture, after talking about all the different things and, and equipping us on the battle, he ends with prayer. Making us as believers understand the importance of prayer in the battle that we face. Ephesians 6, 18, this is the key passage of today. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Somebody say, and pray. And pray. And pray. See, we cannot forget prayer in everything that we face. In the battle of our life, when we're, we're ba- now, we cannot forget it. That's why Paul says, and pray. You have all the armor. And, and, and pray, turn your eyes to the Lord. I love that he ends the, the, the teaching of, of the armor of God and the, and the spiritual warfare by directing us back to God. By directing us back to be fully dependent on God through prayer. By encouraging us, turn to him. Pray, pray, pray. He directs us to the one who holds the victory. The one that we can depend on. You know, it's in the place of prayer, my friends, that we receive the armor of God. It's in the place of prayer, my friend, where truth comes alive. Where the righteousness we talk about comes, where we believe, where faith grows, where we get the peace of God that we've been talking about. It's in the place of prayer where the Holy Spirit talks about the rhema word. All of the armor is in the place of prayer. It's in the place of prayer, my friends, that we bound and loose everything in our life as God has given us the authority that we do not wage war like the world wages war. Because our battle is not of flesh and blood, but of the spirit. It is in prayer. It's in the place of prayer where we fight. The place of prayer where we connect with God. Where we receive from him. Where he refreshes our soul. We're connected to the father. Where we are one with him, walking through life with him. See, we cannot win the battle without prayer. It's important. Today, as we end this series, we end with the posture of prayer. We look at, we learned all those things, but we end with this, turning back to the Lord, being fully dependent on him, relying on him, because my friends, the truth is we cannot win without him. We are too limited. God did not design you to do this alone. We are limited, but the good news, my friend, is this. Prayer connects us who are limited to an unlimited God. That's prayer. And that's the hope that we have in this battle and that that God is the one who is able to do the things that we cannot. He is able to heal. He is able to deliver. He is able to renew the mind. He is able just by one word to change your circumstance. He is able to do the things we cannot. And that is why we turn to him and pray. That is why we are dependent on him throughout this whole life. And the title of the message tonight, and we've been singing about it, the title of the message as we close this series, I want this title, this declaration to ring through your ears as you face every battle that you face because the title of the message today is a declaration that comes from the place and posture of prayer. From a place of prayer, we declare the battle is the Lord's. 
The battle's the Lord's. And that's, that, that, that's what we're going to talk about today, how prayer reminds us and puts our full dependence on God. Because it's his battle. He's the one who gives us victory. And in Paul, he talks about prayer. And he, he, he says in Ephesians 6, 18, that we should pray. And, and today, what I want to do with us today is to outline and encourage us on what he's talking to us about through prayer. We can see clearly here that he's talking about praying for ourselves and praying for others. Apostle Paul is telling us this is in the battle, in the context of your life. You need to pray for yourself and you also need to pray for others. So today as we end this series in relying on God, we're going to look and learn about what type of prayer, how to pray, all the things that he's outlining in scripture today. The first thing, pray for ourselves. See, the truth is we cannot win, we cannot gain ground this year if we do not have a prayer life. We need prayer. We need to consistently, constantly be in communion with God, knowing that prayer is a dialogue that we can talk to him, where we can listen to him, where it's an exchange between us. We're, we're, we're communing with God. Prayer is not just asking and, and just going about life, but it's being with God. It is connecting with him. In the Bible, Ephesians 6, 18, the first part is pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. See, we, we know that in scripture that we see that not only is prayer taught, but prayer is also exercised and demonstrated. We see in the early church, Acts 2, it says what? They devoted themselves to prayer. In fact, in Acts 6, you'll find when other areas, other things of ministry started to come up, you'll see the disciples, they say, delegate that to someone else. They said, we got to focus on prayer and the word. See, prayer is so important, even Jesus himself. You read through the New Testament, you read through the scriptures in his ministry, what you'll find is that Jesus always slips away to do what? To pray. See, it's not only taught about, but we see that people understand its power and they walk in it. They're devoted to it because, you see, Jesus understood. The early church understood that they cannot live life without God. That they needed to depend on him, to live in communion with him through everything. And Paul, through all his letters, he tells them, pray, pray. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourself to prayer. Being watchful and thankful. Today, if you don't have a prayer life, don't be discouraged. That's why we're coming today to encourage you and invite you in a life with God and a life with prayer. I want to speak to every person here that you have. God, God has never closed the line to him. That you can engage in a life of prayer. And I love that we ended the 21 day fasting and prayer. Why? Because us as a church, yes, we can teach about it. Yes, we can talk about it. But us as a church have now realized and lived out and experienced the power of a consistently prayerful life. You know, through 21 days, we committed to prayer and we ourselves can testify on how prayer changes everything. You know, we ourselves have our own stories on how if we continue in prayer, our life changes. See, so we are to have a prayer life through all things. And Paul, he says this, pray in the spirit on all occasions. That's the first point. See, in our lives, we're encouraged to pray in alignment with the spirit that God has given us and invited to come to God in all the occasions of our life. What you need to know is that God has made himself available to you. And you know, this part is the part that baffles me. It's the part that, you know, because God is big. His universe is massive. He's, he's vast. He created everything. He's involved in everybody's life. And you're telling me he has time for my issues. I got a lot of issues. And the answer is yes, he is big, but also so close you see, God invites us to him on all occasions. Why is that? Because God doesn't look at us, our relationship with him, as him the master, you the slave. He looks at it as him the father, you his child. 
In fact, the Bible says that when we're born again, the spirit of God comes inside of us and that spirit cries out, Abba, Father. The spirit that God gives us adopts us into the family of God that, that we would cry out to him. Romans 8 says that the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit testif himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. See, as children of God, your father expects you to come to him. Your father invites his children to himself. You see, a healthy, active, prayerful life merely looks like a father and child. A child communing with their father on all occasions. And Paul, he talks about it. We talked about how he's edifying the church in prayer. He says this, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, in all honesty, I used to read this verse. You know, this verse is taught, you, this is probably not the first time you heard this verse. I used to hear this verse and be like, that's an intimidating verse. Pray continually, pray without ceasing. And, and, and it used to intimidate me, but then I started to realize I stopped looking at it as a command and started to look at it as an invitation. You see, God is, he, he's inviting us to himself continually. See, God is, is saying that he wants to be in relationship with you continually. That he wants to be involved in every area of your life. That he has made himself available to you. And that's the privilege that we have through prayer. That we can come to him in every season, every occasion. That we, we, we can go to him because he desires that relationship with us. You see, we need a Stop looking at prayer as a to-do list item, a religious duty. But we got to start looking at prayer as, a, as the key piece in our relationship with God. As the key place, the, the crucial discipline that we need for our relationship to grow. Because that will, my friends, if we, we change our focus, if we change our view of prayer from just being to do list, something to do, I'll tell you, it will take the pressure off. Because we know relationships aren't perfect. And I'll tell you, I'll encourage you, your, your prayer life doesn't have to be perfect. You know, God desires you to just grow in relationship with him. And sometimes we put so much pressure on ourselves. I was talking to a life group and they, we were talking about prayer last week and they were saying, you know, sometimes for prayer, I gotta have the right worship music. I gotta have the right candles. I gotta make sure there's no distractions. The babies are sleeping. There's no, there's no dishes in, whatever. I, I can't be distracted. My friends, that's not reality. And we have to realize that prayer, it, it, it's, not, you're not, it's not meant to be perfect. It's a relationship with God. It's a dialogue with him. And we know with any relationship, all you really need is quality time. That's all you need. And God, yes, he cares. And obviously, you want to have no distractions. But God cares more about you and him. He cares more about you two being together. That you would make space for him in your life. That you would commune with him. That you would talk with him. Because he wants to be in your life in every occasion. He wants to, to have you cry out to him when you're washing the dishes in the in-between. When you're at workplace and you can catch five minutes and, you, and you're connected with God. When you're driving on the 401 and you're, you're kind of distressed. He wants to be in those moments. But he also wants to be in the moments where you're grieving. And where you're at your lowest place. That you, that you would spend time with him and you would invite him into your life. He also wants to be in the moments where you're on the mountaintop of success. Look at all that I have done. Where your testimonies come through and you're successful and you're rejoicing. He wants to be invited in those moments as well. See, prayer connects us with God. And the beauty about it is that God desires to be with us through all of our life. In all occasions. So, as a church, let's find time in our schedules 
to grow in relationship with him. Let's not limit our spirit, but allow our spirit to cry out to our Father. That in every moment of our life, in the small and the big, we would feel the nearness and presence of God. That's what he has available to us. And that's what Paul is talking about. Pray in the spirit on all occasion. He also says this, bring all kinds of prayers and requests. When we come to God, we also come with all kinds of prayers and all kinds of requests. Paul is saying here, leave nothing unsaid when it comes to God. Give it all to him. Lay it all on the table. Let nothing be unsaid to him. He, he desires you to come to him with everything that is on your mind and on your heart that you would speak to him with all prayers and all kinds of requests. With all prayers, what does that mean? Well, we know there's different types of prayers. And he invites them all to himself. You know, there's the prayers of praise and adoration, thanksgiving. We see that in the Bible in Acts when Paul and Silas are in the prison and they're praising God through prayer. We know that there's also prayers of confession. Jesus teaches us this in Matthew in the disciples' prayer. He says to ask to, to, to be forgiven, that we would go before God and say, God, would you look at all of me? That you would cleanse every part of me? We also know that there's prayers of grief and anguish and sorrow, lamentations, psalms. The Bible is painted with prayers that are full of mourning, full of grief. And God invites those prayers as well. You see, that's what he desires. And there's this beautiful moment in Acts 20 where Apostle Paul, he's talking to the believers and Apostle Paul knows he's going to die. Apostle Paul knows he's not coming back. And he's talking to the believers and he's saying goodbye. And there's this beautiful moment. It says, they all gathered around. They knelt down. They prayed and they wept. See, God desires those prayers too. Where your soul is overwhelmed. Where you don't know what to do. He wants you to turn to him with all types of of prayers, but he also says all types of requests. A request, what is a request? Request is a, is a specific need. He says, come to him with all of your needs. All of the specific requests that you have in your life, come to him, ask of him. Jesus also echoes this. In the disciples' prayer, what did he say? In the middle of all the glorious things that Jesus is teaching us, he says what? Give us this day our daily bread that we would ask God for the things, the daily needs that we have in our life. You see, God understands you have needs. I need someone to hear this. I need you to believe this. God understands that you have a need in your life. And he wants, he wants to move in your life. Ask of him of your needs. Whether it be big or small, ask of God. All kinds of requests. Ask him for the prayer, the parking spot. I'll tell you, testimony, it's a testimony. It works, I'm just saying. We're driving, you know, we're driving. And Rachel, not, Rachel didn't believe it, but now she's a believer. So I'm just gonna pray for a parking spot in Jesus' name. We roll up, parking spot in Jesus' name. Pray for those things. God de desires everything in your heart. Pray for favor for the line. God, favor for, my, for that, for the right grocery store line, in Jesus' name. Pray over your life, everything. He desires you to ask of him everything. And pray for the impossible things. The things that nobody can do in your life. He invites those especially. Because with man, it's not possible. But with God, all things are possible. So we've got to ask of him. And some of us here today, I want to encourage you to cast down your pride. Some of us here today, you know, want to go through life and say, I'm going to do this on my own. And whether you've acknowledged it or not, there's, there's a spirit of pride inside of you where you're saying, I'm just going to prove I don't need to pray. I don't need to ask God. I can figure it out. I am talented. I am capable. I can do it. My friend, yes, that may take you somewhere. But there will be a time. There will be a time where your capacity and your ability is merely not enough. Because this life is too hard. We need God. 
We need to come to him. So I would encourage you, come to him. Ask of him. Cast down our pride. Be humble before him. James 4 says what? You do not receive because you do not ask. Ask of him what's on your heart today. If it's in line with his character, if it's in line with his will, aligned with his word, have confidence that he hears us. 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Philippians 4, we've been reading this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Say every situation. Every Say every situation. every situation. By prayer and petition. With thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. My friend, ask of the Lord. Give the battle to the Lord. Release the battle in your life to God. Give it to Him. Depend on Him. You know, we were singing about it today that we need to have this posture as we're fighting our battles. That we are not dependent on our strength, but dependent on God. You know, in Exodus, there's a passage in a story in Exodus 17. Joshua and Moses, the Amalekites are coming to take over them. And they're coming to fight them. And the Bible says that Moses is on the mountain and his hands are lifted up. And every time he lifts his hand, they start winning. Every time he puts it down, they start losing. So they put his hands back up and they start winning. And Moses, for the whole battle, has his hands lifted high, dependent on God. We don't know exactly why God, you know, told him to raise his hands. But we know that he caused them to be dependent on him. They couldn't do it on their own strength. We need to have that posture in our life where our hands are lifted high. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how gifted you are. God can do the things you cannot. So my friends, have this posture. Amen. Depend on the Lord. Amen. He can do it in your life. There's another story that I love in 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles 20. There's a king there, King Jehoshaphat. And he's overwhelmed. A vast army is coming to overtake them. He doesn't know what to do. He, doesn't, he can't do it. A vast army is coming to, to overtake them. And he prays to God and, and God sends this response to him. He says, 2 Chronicles 20, 15. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. God tells them. You don't need to depend on yourself, depend on me. And I'll tell you what happens in the story. You can read it for yourself, but Jehoshaphat, he leads the army with a choir singing praise. And in that battle, no, none of their soldiers had to fight. The enemy started just to kill themselves. You see, God fought that battle that day. And we, if we rewind it all, let's look at the prayer of King Jehoshaphat and how he prays to God. He says this, 2 Chronicles 20, Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. What a prayer. A prayer of dependence. A prayer of complete surrender. We don't know what we're going to do about this vast army. This is going to take us over. We don't know what to do, God, but what? But our eyes are on you, dependent on you. See, I don't know what I'm going to do with my finances. I don't know what I'm going to do with my health. I don't know what I'm going to do with my, my, my relationships. I don't know what to do, but God, my eyes are on you. That's what we got to pray. That's the posture that we have to have in prayer, that we depend on God through everything. That we depend on him for all of the things in our life. Let me tell you, God will respond. My friends, what is it in your life that you have not asked of God? What battle are you facing that you have not given over to him? What is it in your life that you're holding and you're trying to do on your own strength? Submit it to him in prayer. And I get it, it's hard. I know some of you here might be like, well, pastor, I don't want to pray. Why? Because God doesn't answer prayers. 
Why? Because I'm still suffering. Like, why am I gonna pray if the suffering's still here? Why am I gonna pray if I'm still in the same spot? And my friends, it's a tough question. But, and I wanna talk to you very sensitively because I know, like I really know, talking with a lot of you, that the suffering and the pain is real. And it hurts. And it's hard. And to be honest, I can't answer for God. I can't say on his behalf why he's doing certain things, why he's staying silent, why he's saying no. What? There's many different reasons that we can find on why bad things happen to good people. There's many different reasons that we can rationalize and think of. But at the end of the day, we don't know exactly. I don't know. I can't answer exactly that for you, but, but I think the greater question of what you're asking is, can I still trust him? Is he still good? In my suffering, can I, should I still pray? Can I still trust him even though I'm suffering? And that I can answer. Because my friend, the answer is that yes, you can. Yes, you can trust him. Yes, he is good. Why do I know this? Because the, the God that I know, the God that we serve, the God that is in scripture is not one who leaves us in suffering. It's a God who was in heaven and he, he forfeited heaven to come down to take on the cross for you and me. He's known as the suffering servant. Our God is a God who, who descended from heaven to take the stripes on his back so that me and you can be free. That's the God that we have. So I know your situation is tough, but we have to continue to trust him because he has earned our trust. He has proven his love. He has done it. He has done it for us. We have to remember that we have a God who steps into our messiness, who steps into our world, broken world, who becomes like you and me who dies for us. That's the God that we continue to pray to. The one that if we live this life and he's answered nothing, that he has already earned our whole life. It's him. The Bible says he empathizes with us. He sympathizes. He, he's a God who understands suffering and what we're going through today. It says that in Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He understands. And my friend, we must hold up our one unanswered prayer to the millions of answered prayers that he has had in our life. We have to remember who he is. We got to remember that he is good and he's working out a plan for me in my life. That he remembers our prayers. We have to, we have, to have faith that he is this God. That, and, and sometimes he's silent. And sometimes he does say no. But he promises us that through the silence he is right there with you. He promises us that though he says no, he is embracing you. You see... We might go to God and he might not answer exactly what we want him to answer. But my friend, let me tell you, we will still leave with more of God when we pray. Even if he doesn't answer, we still leave with more of him. I love that John Mark Comer says, he says, the main thing we get out of our prayer isn't different life outcomes. It's God himself. Tyler Sand says, we ask for gifts and we get the giver. See, that's why Jesus reminds us in Luke 11. He says, continue to ask, continue to, to, to knock, continue to seek, continue to knock. He, he, he encourages the believers, continue to do this and you will always receive. Don't be afraid, my friends. Ask of him. All that it is in your life, all requests, all kinds of prayers, all kinds of requests. God wants to hear it from you and he will respond. Let's have a prayer life. Let's be devoted to prayer. The other half is we need to also pray for others. Ephesians 6, 18, it says, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Paul also encourages us, 
Pray for others. You see, we are not in this battle alone, but we are in this battle side by side with an army beside us. We are the church of God. We are the body of Christ. There are many members of the body and, and we cannot you know, go through this life just thinking about ourselves. We have to pray for one another because there's power in it. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. And you'll find, I'll tell you, with all the talents of Paul, with all the things that he's done, all the, the things that he's accomplished in life, you'll find that every time he still asks for prayer. He asks the believers, pray for me. If you continue to read this chapter, you'll find that Paul says, and pray for me. You know, so, so, so that I can fiercely declare the gospel. He invites prayer. He says, I need you to pray for me. See, there's power when we pray for others. Look in 2 Corinthians 1. Paul is talking about his situation. And if you look, look at it, he says, he delivers us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on, behalf, on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. He says it here. He says, as you help us with your prayers. See, we have to believe that when we pray to God, for others especially, that he is moving, that he is listening, that he is hearing us. We have to pray for one another. And Paul says, be alert when praying for one another. Look for opportunities to pray for your brother. Pray for your sister. Pray for the Lord's people. Always be watching. It's not going to come naturally to you. Be alert on how you can step in the gap for them in prayer. He says, be alert. As a church, as Champion Life Center, my friends, let us be a church that prays for one another. Let us be a church that cares about what's going on in each other's life. That we wouldn't be ashamed, but we would stop and pray. That we would stand in the gap. That we, if our brother and sister is sick, we would lay hands on them. That if they have needs, we would stop everything and pray. You see, that is the best thing that we can do for one another. To stand before the gap, in the gap before God. It's not just the right Christian thing to do. But it is effective. And powerful that we can pray for more of heaven to be on earth. And it's one of the greatest ways to show that you love somebody. By standing in the gap, fervently praying for them. James 5 says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Who are you praying for currently in your life? Who is it in your life that you're standing in the gap for? Who is it that you're petitioning for? You're asking for? Who is it? And unfortunately, I'll tell you the truth. Okay? Unfortunately, our cult, in our culture, the Christian culture especially... The word I'm praying for you has now been synonymous with I'm thinking about you or I'm sorry that you're going through this. But my friends, we, we, we cannot miss the power of prayer. You see, when we say we're praying for someone, we need to go before God and petition for them. That we would stop. Somebody's sick. I'm going to stop everything. I'm sorry, but I have to pray. That we wouldn't just say, I'm praying for you. Okay, I thought about them. But we would actually pray and ask of God, because it's God who can move in their life. It's God who can do something in their life. So we need to pray for them. It's not the least you can do, it's the best you can do Amen. to pray for them. The Lord will give them victory as we stand in the gap. And the Bible also says, keep on praying. It says, it says that we should pray and be alert for others, but also keep on praying for them. It's not a one-time thing. We gotta continue to persevere in prayer. Be strongly steadfast in praying for one another. So many times in the Bible, we see people continuing in praying, especially praying for the Lord's people, despite disappointment, despite unanswered prayers. And there's a passage in Acts, and I love it, Acts 12. The Bible says that, you know, Peter was captured. You guys know Peter? He's pretty famous. Peter was captured. And, and now they were gonna, he was in prison. So what happened? The church rallied up. 
So if, if I get in prison, I hope you guys rally up, okay? This is just, there's no reason for me to go there, but just, but they rallied up. And they, start, they, they, they started to pray and pray and pray. What happens? An angel comes and releases Peter. And he's, he's free. And it says that they're continuing to pray. But the detail here on persistence of prayer, the detail here that I don't want us to miss, that, that, is that before Peter was captured, James was also captured. And the Bible says at the beginning of this chapter that James was killed. James wasn't released. You see, the the prayer of the church wasn't answered. But the beauty of it all is that they still prayed for Peter. Despite uncertainty, despite disappointment, they kept on believing. And that's the attitude I want to encourage us in. Through disappointment, keep on trusting. Keep on praying. God will do something. If he disappointed you, continue on. Continue to pray. That's, that's a God that we have, a God who responds. In, in 1 Kings, Elijah, he's on the mountain. It, the, the land is drought. There's no rain. He goes on the mountain. He, he falls to his knees. And the Bible says he prays for rain. He sends his servant to check. There's no rain. So then the servant comes back. He goes back down. He prays for rain. He says, go check. The servant doesn't see anything. So he comes. He does that seven times. He continues in prayer. And I'll tell you, the seventh time, rain fell over the land. He kept on praying. He kept on praying. Keep on praying. The power, the, the, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. It will move the heart of God. You see, Abraham, you know, when, when God was going to destroy the city of Sodom, Remember that story? God's going to destroy the, the city because it's so sinful. Abraham stands in the gap and he, he continues to go back and forth with God. And God relents. And God doesn't destroy. My friends, we need to be in the gap. Continually praying, praying for our loved ones, praying for the lost, praying for all those in our life. We got to continue. Keep on praying. Persevere in prayer. God will respond. My friend, if you've been praying for something, if you have been praying for something and you still haven't heard the answer, continue in it. I want to speak directly to those who are in it something right now. And you're believing and believing nothing has happened. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Have faith. God will do something. You know, the doctor's report is still, still bad. Keep praying. The debt is still there. Keep on praying. You still don't have a job. Keep on praying. The pregnancy test is still negative. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. The doctor says it's impossible. Keep on praying. God will do something. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Keep on praying. Don't give up. And Jesus, in his time here, he, he, he says that. He, he tells them persistent prayer. He talks about a widow who, who comes to a judge and the judge is godless. And he, the, the widow keeps on persisting and persisting. And the, and the judge then does something. And he says, keep on persisting with God. He says, how much more would God respond? That's what he says in, in, in Luke. He says in, in Luke 7, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? That is the God that we have. So keep on praying. I want to tell you, my friends, God is able Stand in the gap. Keep on lifting up prayers for others. Pray for yourself. Don't give up. See, the devil wants you to lose hope. He wants you to give up on God. When God has something for you, the seventh time. Don't give up on the sixth time. Continue in prayer. Our God is faithful and he has earned our trust. As I close today, you know, as we end this series, I want us to run to prayer. I want us to not lose sight of God in the battle. I want us to remember that the battle is the Lord's.